Uh, okay, well, let's uh, just open up with prayer. <clears throat> Father, I do thank you for this evening, and I do thank you that you're in charge of our lives. And I ask you, Lord, tonight to be the one who guides our steps and directs our paths. And I thank you for the anointing, Father, that you bring forth and that it opens up the door to your word. And I ask, Father, for your word to open up that we might have the truth that sets us free. And I thank you for that, Father. We ask you to be glorified and magnified tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. We're uh, going to look at two very special people in the, uh, in the Bible, both of them in the Old Testament. Um, it was just today as I came to church and I looked at some mail that we had uh, delivered to the church. There was a group that uh, wanted to meet and they wrote to us because we're simply a, a church listed in the, in the phone book. And so they wrote to us because there are a bunch of homosexuals out there who are uh, trying to, uh, to uh, band together. And so they wanted us to band together against those homosexuals and uh, so that we might join together to pray and take up a collection for this organization here in Dayton. And, uh, and I thought, well, that's intriguing. And uh, especially, you know, when you try to talk to some of these churches about, uh, you know, what God is saying to the gay community, you end up with, um, if you will get uh, anything at all, you might get a statement like, well, you know, they have to become a heterosexual if they're really saved, or you get, well, or they have to be celibate. And there's no possibility for gay people to have an emotional love attachment. And tonight we're going to look in the Word at people who have an emotional love attachment with someone of the same sex. And we're not able to definitively state that, uh, that they consummated that relationship in a sexual way, but we certainly know that it's very clear that their love uh, was very deep and very true. And uh, I want to, I've stated that these two people are from the Old Testament. We're going to look at David and we're going to look at Ruth. And before we look at either of those, I want to look at both of them in the New Testament. If we look at the Gospel of Matthew and we turn to chapter 1, it's interesting that both these people who have a same-sex uh, love affinity for someone of the same sex it, uh, are both listed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Matthew 1, 1 begins, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judas and his brethren. And Judas begot Pharaoh and Zerah of Thamar, and Pharaoh begot Ezram, and Ezram begot Aram, and Aram begot Aminadab, and Aminadab begot Naasan, and Naasan begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz begot Obed of Ruth. There's one of them. Interesting. Uh, this uh, Rahab the harlot is listed right there. Salmon begot Boaz of Rechab, or uh, Rahab. And Boaz begot Obed of Ruth. Ruth is a woman who uh, we will see has a, has a strong emotional love attachment to another woman. And then Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. And so I want to just stop at that point. Uh, well, and I'll finish verse 6. And David be Jesse begot David the king, and David the king begot Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. So that's Bathsheba. So we have, uh, throughout Christianity, always talked about David and Bathsheba and what a mess David got into there. Um, David was uh, convicted by the Holy Spirit for his sin of adultery and murder by taking Bathsheba away from her husband. But David was never convicted for any of the other many, many sexual escapades that he had. He had many wives, and we see that he has a love relationship with a man. Never is any of that condemned. What is condemned is the adultery uh, and, the, uh, and then the subsequent murder of Urias, the Hittite. So we see that uh, here's Ruth in verse 5 being listed, as well as Rahab, who was a harlot. All people that God chose to, uh, to put in the lineage of the king of the universe, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who when God the Father sent 
uh, over, by overshadowing uh, Mary, he chose that lineage with those people and those individuals and chose to put their names in sacred holy writ in the scriptures and to list them among the, uh, those who you know, were the ones who, through whom the redemptive prom promise came forth. So I think that's interesting. We're going to look first at Ruth and Naomi. There's not much to look at because the book of Ruth is where we're going and the book of Ruth is a very small book. It only has uh, four chapters and it just tells the story, not so much of Ruth, but uh, as much as it is of Naomi. Naomi, in chapter one, we find out, is a woman who uh, has a husband whose name is Elimelech, and Elimelech uh, marries Naomi and takes her uh, and her two sons, Malon and Chilion, uh, to the land of Moab. Moab was not where they were supposed to be living as the people of Israel. It was not part of the promised land. So he was out from under the covenant of uh, being in the promised land when he left. And as a result, some calamity did fall upon him. Uh, the husband dies and then the two sons die. But while the sons are still alive in the land of Moab, each of them takes a wife, a, Moab a Moabitess, uh, each of them. So. If we pick up with uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, and we're going to read to verse 18, we'll get the story here, and we'll see the storyline. Now, it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, uh, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. Now, if you know anything about the covenant that God has with the people of Israel, this is absolutely a no-no. They were not to take women uh, from foreign tribes and from foreign gods because it would be bondage to them to get linked up with an unbeliever. So they weren't to do this at all, but they did it anyway. They weren't supposed to leave the promised land, but they did it anyway. And, uh, and so they come under some, you know, some calamity befalls them. So they uh, take these two wives, verse 4, of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about 10 years. And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. In other words, now Naomi doesn't have her boys anymore, and she doesn't have her husband either. And she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. So the promise is in the promised land where it belongs. Wherefore she went forth of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, which remember now are not Israelites, they are in fact Moabites, Moabitess women. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. The Lord has, the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters, why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them until they were grown? Would you stay uh, for them from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Of course, the hand of the Lord hadn't gone out against her. She was not where she belonged or where she should be. But nonetheless, that's what she thought. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, now, we'll just stop there for a minute, and it, and it's, it says here, Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her, or really clung unto her. In other words, Orpah gives her mother-in-law a kiss, 
and really it's a kiss goodbye. You know, well, you've given us good advice. There's no reason for me to hang on here because I've got to get a husband now and get on with my life. And, and you're right. It's what, basically what Orpa is saying. And I think that this is probably a normal response. There's a, a, you know, a, a typical response, what you might expect. And Ruth said, uh, well, no, verse 15, and she said, behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. So in other words, now we come to Orpah has left. Orpah gave Naomi a kiss and said, you know, well, goodbye. And she went back to her people, went to go live in her mother's house and her father's house and live with them until she could find a new husband. But Ruth is clinging to Naomi. She won't let her go. And Ruth says, verse 16, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. And the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Now these words that Ruth says to, say to Naomi as she's clinging to her, and saying, you know, don't make me leave you. I'm going to stay with you until you die. I will never leave you. Nothing, nothing can separate us. And she's saying, these words, entreat me not to leave thee or return from following thee. If you listen carefully, you've probably heard these words somewhere before. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, will I die. And there will I be buried. And the Lord do so, do so to me and more also if anything but death parts you and me. Those are the words that are used in heterosexual marriage ceremonies again and again and again throughout the nation and uh, probably throughout many parts of the world in mar marriage customs. And people take a hold of those words and they don't realize who's saying those words. They just pull those words out of context. And so a woman says to a husband uh, as she's marrying her, her, her groom, and the groom says to his bride, you know, uh, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. These are, in fact, wedding vows. And Naomi and Ruth, Ruth is proclaiming this kind of love that is used in marriage vows um, for generations to come to her mother-in-law. She's saying, I, I'm not going to leave you. And verse 18 says, when she saw that, that uh, she, meaning Ruth, was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she stopped speaking unto her. Not, she left off speaking. In other words, she didn't continue to forcefully say, well, you better go home now. Now, you better leave. You should leave. You better go back to your parents. There's nothing here for you with me. So she stops uh, persuading her to leave and says, all right then, come on. And I think that's a beautiful uh, love story, regardless of whether it may or may not be a lesbian love story. It certainly is a love story between two women. And, uh, and that love is proclaimed and that love is declared and people have taken those words and enjoyed them in their own marriage ceremonies for centuries to come and still do. So <clears throat> that's what we have on Ruth and Naomi. Ruth and Naomi go back and they're blessed and, and the Lord blesses them. And, and you see ultimately Ruth then uh, honors this covenant. God honors this covenant that Ruth makes with Naomi and makes Ruth an ancestor of Jesus. And so um, you can see that it's, God didn't say, oh my, oh my, oh my, what's going on here? <laughs> God didn't get nervous that Ruth was proclaiming love for Naomi. And God, in fact, blessed her and blessed that relationship and then gave them, you know, uh, a way to become linked in with uh, prosperity and, and blessing and, and other good things. So we leave off Ruth and Naomi with that note and we're going on to David. To find David, we have to turn to the book of 1 Samuel, which is uh, the next book after Ruth here. 1 Samuel starts off by telling us about the, uh, well, the prophet Samuel, then Israel asking for a king. And when Israel asks God for a king, Saul becomes the king. But Saul's heart is not 
wholeheartedly after the Lord his God. And so God wants to raise up another king uh, who will have his heart tender towards the things of God. And so David is a shepherd boy who is out in the fields watching over his flock. And the prophet Samuel comes by under the direction of the Holy Spirit and anoints Samuel. Uh, Samuel anoints David to become the next king of Israel. Several decades have to go by before that ever comes to pass. But God begins to exalt David in the kingdom of Israel. God begins to make his name known. God begins to take him from being just a shepherd boy and puts him right in the household of the king, King Saul. And when David shows up in the palace, several people fall in love with him. One of those people is the daughter of the king. Her name is Michal. And we find this in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 20 and 21. So we're going to turn there to begin with. <clears throat> 1 Samuel 18, verse 20. And it says, And Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul the thing, and the thing pleased him. And Saul said, I will give him her, that she may be a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Saul was jealous of David, and he thought perhaps if he would uh, let David marry his daughter, then he'd always have inside information, and he could always, uh, you know, plant some things and trap David and do some other things, because David was being exalted in the kingdom, and Saul could see it. And Saul was jealous, and Saul was nervous about this young boy, David. So he thought, oh, this is good that my daughter loves this David. Now this word loved in Strong's in Hebrew is number 157. And Ahab is the word. Ahab in Strong's 157 means to love in the same way that uh, the English word means to love. It has a broad sense of meanings. But it means to not only to love and to be fond of, but it means to delight and to desire. There's a desiring uh, with this word. It denotes a strong emotional attachment and a desire to possess or to be in the presence of the object of love. You know, like when you just fall in love and you just you want to be around the person all the time. That's what this is talking about, that kind of love. So it says this about Michal. And people look at that and go, oh, well, of course, you know, she was in love. And you look at that and you understand it, and, it, and it, it, it reads the way that you would expect it to read. However, back up to 1 Samuel 18, 1. We discover the same word, 157, Ahab again. And uh, we're going to begin with verse 1, and we're going to go to verse 7. And it says, And it came to pass that when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that David had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Now, Jonathan is Michal's brother. He's a prince in the kingdom of Israel. He's next in line for the throne after his father Saul would die. Jonathan is the king to be. And Jonathan's soul, what is our soul? We've learned our soul is our emotions, our heart, our feelings, our intellect, our mind, uh, and our personality. All of that, it says, was knit with uh, the soul, the intellect, the personality, the heart, and the mind of David. And Jonathan loved him, the same word as his sister loves him. So now when David shows up in the, in the court of the king, not only does the daughter of the king fall in love with David, but the son of the king falls in love with David, Jonathan. So we look at here, and Saul took him that day and wouldn't let him go, would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant. Now this is verse 3, long before verse 20, which told us Michal loved him. So long before 
McCall ever lets it known to her dad that she's in love, Jonathan zeroes in on David and makes a covenant. Look at verse 3. And Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. So what is this covenant? It's a covenant of love. Look at this, this next thing, and you're going to see that this is a marriage ceremony you're looking at in verse 5. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him. Here's a little shepherd boy coming into the courtroom, and here he is, the prince, next in line for the rulership of Israel, and he takes off his royal robe, and he puts it upon him, which in a marriage ceremony symbolizes that I will be your covering. I will cover you. I will give you my name. I will give you protection. I will be your covering. So he takes off his robe that was on him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword, his protection, his way to make a livelihood, and to his bow and to his girdle. Everything royal and kingly that he has, he gives to David, making a covenant of love with him. Now that's very intriguing for people who want to say, well, Boy, they were good friends, weren't they? Well, I guess. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the man of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also the sight of Saul's servants. So you see, Jonathan and David make this covenant of love kind of on the sly. Saul doesn't know about it. Nobody else knows about it. But um, nonetheless... David does, and Jonathan does. Now let's go to, um, we, we recognize here, though, that in, in that verse 1, that loved him as his own soul, same word as his sister. Loves him, same word, as his sister loves him. And she becomes his wife. She becomes David's wife. Now, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 19, it says, verse 1, and Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. Saul's just very, very jealous and just insanely jealous about, Jonathan, uh, about David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father seeks to kill you. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take heed to yourself until the morning and abide in a secret place and hide yourself. So Jonathan comes to save the one that he's knit to, the one that he loves, he comes to save his life and tell him, and because it says in verse 2, because Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much, delighted. Hebrew, Shaphetz, 2654 in Strong's. This word, delighted, means to find pleasure in, to have an affection for. It means to desire. The main meaning of this word, 2654, Shafetz, is a strong positive attraction and involves subjective involvement. In other words, your emotions are involved, your feelings are involved, everything about you who makes you you is a strong positive attraction. You just can't help yourself. And that's what this says. Saul's son delighted much. Jonathan delighted Shafetz in David. He's really crazy about him. That's why he's risking, you realize, he's risking his own neck to go tell David, watch out, my father, the king, is out to kill you. But he loves him enough to risk his own life to save him. Then we go to 1 Samuel chapter 20. I mean, we, we could read all of this, but we'd have to go on for chapter after chapter and verse after verse. And I want you to read this on your own and read the story for yourself. But we're going to look at basically at Jonathan and David. So chapter 20, I'm going to read you verses 1 to 4. And David fled from Naoth in Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What's my sin? And what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? And he said unto him, God forbid, you will not die. Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, but he will show it to me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. And David swore moreover and said, Your father certainly knows that I have found grace. 2580. That I have found grace, grace in your eyes. Grace means preciousness, loveliness, 
favor and charm. You find me charming. And your father knows that you find me charming. And he said, let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord lives and as thy soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Then Jonathan said unto David, whatever your soul desires, I will even do it for thee. So Jonathan says, I don't care whatever it is, David. If I have to put my life on the line again, whatever you want, I will do it because, um, you know, I love you. But David is saying, you're saying to me that, you know, your father wouldn't do any of this stuff unless he would tell you first, but your father knows. Your father certainly knows that you find me charming, that you find me precious, that you find me lovely, and that I have favor in your sight. So obviously they knew, dad knew, is what they're saying here. And so in the same chapter, we'll pick up with verse 14 in this storyline. And uh, we're going to read through verse 17. And this says, <clears throat> here's uh, Jonathan now speaking to David. And listen to what Jonathan says. And you shall not only, while yet I live, show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not, but also you shall not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one of them from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. You see, they made a covenant before, which was a covenant of protection, the same kind of covenant that's made in a marriage ceremony. Now, Jonathan's making a second covenant with David. And in this covenant, he's asking David for something. And what he's saying to David is, I not only want you to promise me that you'll be good to me, but I want you to promise me that if anything happens to me, you'll raise my children. Now, that's very unusual because David is a threat to the throne. And you would not usually, if you're the prince next in line for the throne, ask your father's enemy who's trying to get the throne to watch your children and take care of your kids if anything happens to you. He should have asked his sister, Michal. He should have asked his other sisters. He should have asked his other brothers. Now, if anything happens to us, you know, we're all going to make an agreement that we'll watch each other's children. No, because they've made a love covenant with one another in which they have vowed protection that now Jonathan is saying, read this in verse uh, 15, but also you shall not cut off your kindness from my house or his children forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off the enemies of David, every one of them from the face of the earth. So, so David is now being put into a, a situation with Jonathan that he's saying, yes, Jonathan, I'll raise your children. Intriguing. Isn't that interesting? So not only has Jonathan given him his robes and his girdle and his sword and his, his promise of life and promised love to him and allegiance to him, now he's saying, I want you to watch my children also if anything happens to me. Well, that, and we also know that, that David is aware that dad knows about what's going on here. Now that would be pretty good and we could make a pretty good case with just that, but that's not all there is. So we go on and we look at this in this story. Uh, in s chapter 20, we pick up again with uh, verse 30. And before I do, I'll just tell you, okay, so what's going on so that this will not be out of context for us. There is a... Uh, the king, Saul, is very angry. He's trying to kill David. He wants David dead. And he has invited David to already live in the, in the castle, to live in the, to live in the court. And for several days, David isn't showing up because David knows Saul's trying to kill him. So David's on the hideout. And, he's, and Jonathan 
is trying to feel out his father over those couple of days as to whether or not dad's really that mad or not. Whether dad is really so angry as he's going to kill the one that he loves. And so as they're sitting to dinner, Saul finally asks the question, not of any of the servants or anyone else, not even of Michal, but of Jonathan, where is David? And when David says the excuse that they've agreed upon, Saul gets furious. And he's furious in verse 30. And so, you know, many times when you're angry, you will say exactly what you mean. The things that you have been in politeness not saying because you don't want to say them, but when you have just had enough and enough is enough and you've blown your gasket out of your mouth, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so Saul begins to spout off and say what he really believes here. And he says, Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said unto him, You son of the perverse, rebellious woman, blaming the mother, but calling Jonathan a pervert, saying, You pervert, but blaming the mother. <laughs> Do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse, David, to your own confusion and under the confusion of your mother's nakedness. In other words, you're really a pervert and don't you think I know that? I know that you are. I know that you're in love with this David. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, you know, you're, you're, you're perverted. Your mother's perverted. You know, he's blaming it all on the mother, but he's acknowledging what he already believes. He believes that Jonathan is in love with David, and he says so. So dad wasn't blind to the whole thing. Dad's aware of it. And he says, um, for as long as the son of Jesse lives upon the ground, you will not be established, nor your kingdom. Therefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. See, he knows the only one who knows where David is, is Jonathan, because Jonathan's in love with him. So he's saying to Jonathan, not to any of the servants who might have known where he might be, not to his wife even, but only to Jonathan. Jonathan, you know where he is, now you go get him. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said unto him, Why? Why? Why, why shall he be slain? What has he done? And Saul cast a javelin at Jonathan to kill him, whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to kill David. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and did not eat meat the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had done him shame. So now they've got a prearranged agreement, which we've skipped over. And that is once Jonathan finds out whether King Saul really is that angry and really that determined to kill David or not. Either way, Jonathan knows where David's hiding out, and J Jonathan and David have an agreement that then David will be told, he'll get, Jonathan will get the message to David and let him know, if my dad's really that mad and he's trying to kill you, I'm going to let you know at the risk of my own life. If he's not and it's okay and you can come on back home and live with us again, then I'll let you know that too. So they work out the arrangement. They, the, he has got this, this system worked out uh, with a little boy. He takes a little boy and he goes and shoots some arrows and the arrows go this way and he says something that means something. David listening for what he says to the boy as he goes to get the arrows. And then he brings the, uh, sends the little boy back into town and then David comes out of hiding. And uh, verse 40 of chapter 20 the Jonathan gave his artillery unto his lad and it said unto him go carry them to the city and as soon as the lad was gone David arose out of the place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times and they kissed one another and they wept with one another until David exceeded or that means until David got control of himself and so they know now that they're going to be separated and they're going to have to, they're not going to be able to be with one another anymore because King Saul's trying to kill him. 
Now, in, uh, in Jonathan, verse 42, Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and you, and between my seed and your seed forever. And he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Jonathan says, It's okay. We can separate for a time because we've made a covenant. And that covenant's not only for me and for you, but for each of our generations from now on. In other words, I'm going to watch over your children, you're going to watch over my children. They've basically established a household kind of covenant. And yet at the same time in doing that, um, uh, th that's how come Jonathan can deal with the separation because of the covenant that they've made, the covenant of love. Now, we come to uh, chapter 23 of 1 Samuel. So David's gone into hiding, and uh, David's got a little retinue of men with him, 600 men who are following around, and they're doing little exploits out in the countryside and doing that and this, that, and the other. As Saul is still trying to find him. Saul's still trying to trap him. Saul's still trying to kill him. 23, verse 14. And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the wood. You know, it's a very dangerous thing to do. And strengthened his hand in God. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you, and you will be king over Israel. Now isn't that interesting? Because Jonathan's supposed to be king over Israel. But Jonathan says to David, David, you will be king. And look at what he says next. He says, You will be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. And that also Saul my father knows. Well, let me ask you a question. If you've got two thrones set up and one is for the king, who sits next to the king? And Jonathan says, I'm going to be right next to you. Now, Jonathan's supposed to be the king. Jonathan is supposed to be able to say, I'll be the king and I'll let you be the highest official in the land and sit next to me if he wants to do that, if he's a good friend. But he does and he says, you'll be the king. In other words, Jonathan probably considers David his husband. He's saying, you'll be the king and I'll sit right next to you. Now that's a very unusual thing for a king to say. In fact, you'll never find that anywhere else in the word of God for some king to say that to a stranger who was a shepherd boy who came to play a few songs in the court. But he does. And they too made a covenant before the Lord. Here he is, Jonathan again, saying, come on, David, reaffirm our vows again. And they made a covenant before the Lord, and David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. Jonathan again risked his neck to get out there and tell him, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Even my dad knows that you're going to be king, and I'm going to be right next to you. I like that, I have to say. So that's verses 16 and 17. But that's not how it happens. The rest of the story is Jonathan and his father go out to war. And because King Saul is so far from God that there's no way he's going to be established as king and he loses the battle. Not only does he lose the battle, but he loses his life. And King Saul is killed, and his sons are killed with him, among them Jonathan. In 2 Samuel chapter 1, David gets the news that Jonathan is dead. And what does David say when he finds out that Jonathan is dead? Let me read you verse 19 first. He says, the beauty of Israel is slain upon thy high places. How are the mighty fallen? 
verse 23. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. Ye daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet and other delights, and who put on ornaments of gold upon your apparel. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of battle? O oh, Jonathan, you were slain in your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been unto me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. Passing the love of women. And David would know because he had a lot of women. But if he had to pick the love that he got, he chose Jonathan's because it was the best. Jonathan who said, you can be king. Come on. You can be king. Just promise me that I'll sit next to you. Just promise me that You'll watch over my children and you'll take care of my kids and I'll take care of yours. And the covenant that they made in the beginning of chapter 18 because he loved him as he loved his own soul. The most beautiful thing I think that we see is in 2 Samuel chapter 9. That covenant that Jonathan and David had made even after Jonathan died, David kept it. Look at chapter 9. Let me read you this story. David is now the king. And David said, Is there yet any that's left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Jonathan's been dead for a while now, for a number of years. But now David is king. And he stops and he says, is there any kid that for Jonathan's sake I can take care of? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, are you Ziba? And he said, thy servant is he. And the king said, is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan, hath yet a son, which is lame in his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiliel uh, in Lodibar. And King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir. And now, verse 6, And when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. See, now, what you don't know and what we have skipped over is the fact that the household of Saul, who was left in Saul's house, went to war against David and the kingdom in order to establish Saul's lineage still, even though Saul had died and Jonathan had died. There was still one other son still left, and he was trying to be king, and he had the commander of the army, and there was a war for seven years. And so when Mephibosheth comes before David because David has summoned him, and he's lame, he can't help himself, he can't do a thing for himself. He falls flat on his face and he declares, he says, um, Behold thy servant. He, he calls himself uh, a, simply a dead dog. Verse 8, And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I am? He, and he considers himself good as a dead dog, too, because now he's in front of the king who can kill him at a moment's notice and has every right to because their households have been at war for so many years. Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I've given unto thy master's son all that pertains to Saul and to his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him. He's lame. He can't till it for himself. And you shall bring in the fruits that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, my, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. David remembered the covenant between he and Jonathan when Jonathan said, just promise me you'll watch for, out for my kids. 
if anything happens to me. And David fulfills that covenant, that covenant of love that they had made. He says, yes, I will. So once he's established as king, is there anybody from Jonathan's side? Yeah, there's one, this little lame kid. Bring him to me. And when they did, Mephibosheth was scared. What are they going to do? Not too many people knew about the covenants that David and Jonathan had made. Not too many people knew about the feelings that Jonathan had for David. But I think it's pretty clear that Jonathan was in love with David and that Jonathan was willing to give everything to be near him, anything, including his life many times. And so, verse 13, Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem and he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame in both his feet. So it's this David that we found in Matthew chapter 1 that lists David among the ancestors of Jesus. And David was never rebuked for being in love with Jonathan or considering Jonathan's love greater than the love of women. David was never rebuked for taking uh, the many women that he had as wives, not as many as his son Solomon by any means, but he did have a few concubines of his own. David was never rebuked for any of his relationships except the one that he did illegally and wrongfully. And only that one, and it wasn't Jonathan, it was Bathsheba, only that one did God ever rebuke him for. And God still put David's name in the list that made him in the lineage of Jesus Christ. So I think that when we look at this story, it's hard to look at this story and not say that uh, it doesn't ever tell us that they ever had a sexual uh, encounter, but it doesn't tell us they didn't. But it does tell us the feelings that were involved. And those are very, very clear. It's very clear that Jonathan was in love with David because that's what the Word of God says. So when people say things like where we began, if you're a Christian and you have those feelings, you better pray through till you get right. They don't really know what the Word says because the Word affirms those feelings. The Word does not rebuke those feelings and the word doesn't denigrate those feelings. But the word, in fact, shows David's honor in that relationship by carrying out the covenant. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. You're not ashamed or afraid to expose what you knew about these people, that you truly recorded it and just showed it and shared it with us. And Father, we ask you to let us be as honorable as David in the sense that when we make a covenant, we will fulfill the things that we've said. Let our love, Father, be as strong as the love that Ruth declared for Naomi when she said, if anything but death parts us, God, you take charge. Lord, I thank you for what you have done and what you're doing in this day. And I thank you that you're bringing restoration to the body of Christ. Father, I ask you to continue to be glorified in this area. In Jesus' name, amen. And he said, take hold of my covenant and I will be your God. Take hold of my covenant and with the angels cry if you will keep my Sabbath and please be in your ways. I'll be your God and add unto you many, many days. Take hold of my covenant and I will be your God. Take hold of my 
I come.